Hello friends. Welcome to You Step In Hope Ministries. My name is Hans Peters and I pastor here. As we enter into the warm season of the year on this side of the globe, our days are getting longer and longer and the nights are getting shorter. You know what that means? Well, to me, it means that God gives us a little more time of day to enjoy what he has created. Today, am I starting a new series titled The Freedom of the Will. And the title of today's message is God's Will. And for the scripture reading, I'll be going right to the beginning of the Bible. Today, we'll look at the book of Genesis, chapter 1. But let's begin in prayer. Lord God, in three persons, Father and Creator, Son and Redeemer, Spirit and Advocate, we ask for your presence to enter this virtual space. We know about self-giving love. Your very nature teaches us how to love one another. And Lord, we call upon you to teach us this hour. Teach us to pray. Teach us to love. Teach us to be one as you are one. Because from the beginning of time to the end of eternity, you have chosen to use your power and majesty to love us, to redeem us, to shape us as your people. And so, may your power inflame us with your peace. May your peace touch us with your grace. May your grace fill us with your hope. May your hope lead us into your kingdom. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. History tells us that the author of the book of Genesis was Moses and that it was written for the people of Israel. Its purpose was to record God's creation of the world and his desire to have people worship him. And this was God's first and original will. This book was written when Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness, during Israel's wandering, somewhere in the Sinai Peninsula. <laughs> so, all this creation started out in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some scientists say that the number of stars in creation is equal to all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. So many, and maybe even more. Yet all this complex sea of spinning stars functions with remarkable order and efficiency. Right? <laughs> Quite honestly, to say that the universe just happened or evolved requires more faith than to believe that God's will is behind this amazing and ordered universe. God truly did create a wonderful universe. Genesis 1 verses 2 to 18 describes it in detail. It says there, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky. 
And evening and morning came and marked, or marking, the second day. Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the water seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation. Every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation. All sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. An evening passed, and morning came, marking the third day. Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to cover, govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. God did not need to create the universe, folks. Get this, he chose, he chose to create it. Why? Well, God is love. And love is best expressed towards something or someone else. So I believe God created the world and the people as an expression of his love. And I believe that God shared one of his main attributes, love, with humanity. So think of that image from verse 2 of the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters. I was comparing that image to a mother bird I recently saw. That bird, a robin, was caring for and protecting its young. This robin had built a nest on our porch to have her chicks. It was protecting and warming and later feeding them. In this image of hovering, I see that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were actively involved in the creation of the world. And friends, God's care and protection is still active. And that is something we need to recognize and remember. What a wonderful thought, right? Okay, with this image in mind, this powerful reminder as a backdrop in our mind. Let's read today's scripture. If you have your Bible with you, whether paper or app, and you're able, please open your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. I'll be reading from verse 19 to 31, and I will continue on in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So, here's what it says there. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters swarm with fish and other life. 
Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the skies, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Chapter 2 So the creation of heavens of the heavens and the earth, and everything in them, was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And that, friends, is the word of the Lord for us today. Verse 25 ends with, And God saw that it was good. Just as God felt good about his work, we might be pleased with our work when it is well done. However, I think we should not feel good about our work if God would not be pleased with it. This leads me to an obvious question. What are you doing that both pleases both God and you? <laughs> then again, God says in the second half of verse 26, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. You know, one view says that this is a, a reference to the, to the Trinity, where God says us and our God the Father, Jesus Christ his Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of whom are God. 
Another view is that the plural wording is used to denote majesty. Kings, after all, traditionally use the plural form in speaking of themselves. Now, the grammar in our text doesn't decide the matter for us. But in either case, it is God who creates humans in his image. And God has revealed himself to us as, as a trinity. He's done it clearly throughout the whole of Scripture. Okay, here are some things to think about. First, what does it mean to be like God? Second, we bear God's image. And third, think on this. God is pleased with how he made you. Okay, the first thought, to be like God. Scripture obviously is not saying that God created us exactly like himself. Because after all, God has no physical body. Instead, we are a reflection of God's glory. Some feel that the image of God can be found in one or more of the uniquely human capabilities or capacities for reason, creativity, speech, or self-determination. More likely, the image of God is something that describes our entire being as humans. Not just one aspect. God made humans to be in a special relationship with him and to reign over creation as his ambassadors and administrators here on earth. And folks, we should reflect this, his character in our love, in our patience, in our forgiveness, in our kindness, in our faithfulness. Yes? yes. The second thought, we bear God's image. And I feel that it is God's will that we know that we are made in God's image. And that, folks, provides a solid basis for self-worth. Just keep in mind, human worth is not based on possessions. It's not based on achievements. It's not based on physical attractiveness or public acclaim. Instead, it is based on being made in God's image. Yes? Because we bear God's image, we may feel positive about ourselves. Criticizing or downgrading ourselves is criticizing what God has made and the abilities that he has given us. Let me ask, does knowing that you are a person of worth help you love God? Does it help you know him personally? Does it help you make a valuable contribution to those around you? Here's a lesson for us. Scripture places both man and woman at the pinnacle of God's creation. That means neither gender is exalted over the other. Nor is either gender to be depreciated. The second lesson might be this, coming from verse 28. Yes, God gave us his free will, but God is the ultimate ruler over all the earth, and he exercises his authority with loving care. When God delegated some of his authority to the human race, he expected us to take responsibility for the environment and the other creatures that share our planet. God was careful how he made this earth. So folks, that means we must not be careless about how we take care of it. Yes? Number three. Remember and think on this. God is pleased with how he made you. Verse 31. 
Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. God saw that all he had created was not good, but very good, excellent in every way. And friends, you are part of God's creation. Remember that, even when you're suffering, when you've lost your job, or maybe when you're sick. Don't lose hope, but be faithful to him. He is pleased with how he made you. If at times you feel worthless, maybe because you're in a wheelchair or in prison or sick in bed or alone, remember that God made you for a good reason and you are valuable to him. Yes? Okay, here's something we might need to apply to our own lives. God says, I am with you always. And second, be sanctified. The first thought, I am with you always. Yes, you are valuable. Remember how it's said about the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the earth at the beginning of creation. Friends, I believe He, God, still is. He's still hovering over the surface of the earth. He is always close to you, to me, to us. He is always ready to listen to our talk and our prayers. Also, remember when Jesus told his disciples to go in Matthew 28, verse 16? Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Now, verses 17 to 20. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples. And friends, Jesus is saying the same thing to us today and to the next generations. Verse 18. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yes? Yes. Second, be sanctified. God blessed his creatures, those of the sky and of the sea. God blessed all humankind, and God blessed the seventh day after resting from all his work, and he sanctified that day. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, first half of verse 3, reminds us, though, God's will is for you to be holy. Folks, we live in an action-oriented world. There's always something to do. Something that just needs to be done. Like right now. And there seems to be no time to rest. But God says in verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 2, On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Folks, when God finished his work and rested, God is declaring that he has utterly controlled chaos and that he rules over all creation. Yes. And so, too, we need to remember that day of rest because our times of rest refresh us. Yet we are sinful by nature. We tend not to listen. But we need to remember that to rest is the will of God. This means stepping away from worldly things and sin. If God himself rested from his work, well, he, God, might not have needed it. But we should not be surprised that we certainly do need rest. 
Jesus demonstrated this when he and his disciples left in a boat to get away from the crowds. In Mark 6, uh, verses 31 and 32, you can read that. Friends, the act of sanctifying or consecrating the seventh day is to set apart this day from ordinary space and time and to place it within sacred space and time. Despite our inclination to observe the Sabbath as a day of worship in a special space or in church, the fourth commandment of Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, does not instruct Israel to build an altar and worship God. Instead, it is an invitation to imitate God as those who are made in God's image and likeness by setting one day aside as holy and rest. Hearing this good news, wherever we should find ourselves, in whatever circumstances, we should be able to sing with the psalmist, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Yes. yes. Well, friends, let's pray. Father God, you are holy. You are the creator of the universe we are in. And on the seventh day, you rested. Lord, you gave us that command, the command for us to rest and be holy because you are holy. Lord Jesus, you yourself gave us examples of how to rest, to be apart from the world. So thank you for teaching us your will, for teaching us your will for our lives. Lord, help us to separate the things and the actions of the world from the things that are dedicated to you. Let us be an example to others. Let us worship only you and bring the good news to the ends of the earth. For it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Friends, allow me to speak a benediction. So now as we leave the space of worship, and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing. We know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other as we go to love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, be blessed until we meet again.